just a little bit of background on me. Um, I went to school for computer programming. I, uh, my father was a contractor. I started off uh, helping my father, and I was painting the inside corners of closets and shutters, the old shutters that go on the outside of houses. And I worked for him for years or with him for years and learned uh, the trade of carpentry and, uh, and, uh, and, and construction. Um, pre uh, my property and casualty tenure, um, I was a carpenter, I was a builder, I did emergency services, board ups, and um, uh, after uh, buildings or homes had a, a, a loss, I'd go and do emergency services. So that got me into the property and casualty world. Um, I started my uh, claims tenure in 1992 with Hurricane Andrew. I've done almost every major hurricane uh, since Andrew. And I've, when I say I've done them, I've estimated or adjusted claims in those storms, not only for uh, insurance, but I've written estimates for insurance companies. I've written, I, I currently write estimates for uh, insurance companies uh, through a, a construction company that I, a senior estimator for. Um, I've adjusted and consulted over four hundred on over four hundred million dollars worth of claims. I've done um, for those uh, familiar with Katrina. I wrote the estimates for the um, Lower Ninth Ward public housing, uh, which was a forty-six million dollar project. In estimating, I've also handled a eight hundred dollar kicked in door with a five hundred dollar deductible. So I, I do claims, and, and I write estimates, and I know values. Um, I'm the Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer of Town for Claims Management. We've worked with attorneys in settling over $50 million worth of Sandy claims. Um, I'm a senior estimator at Reliance Contracting, who's a licensed New Jersey home builder and renovation contractor. And I don't know if this screen goes down a tiny bit, but there is something below that. Yeah. me in my uh, other costume when I'm estimating. So in order, the, the goal for today is for me to kind of give you guys um, an idea of where to look and how to look for discrepancies or, or differences. Um, So the goal is that I, I show you where to look for deficiencies or um, look into an estimate and kind of give you a guide of where to go to to see if there's deficiencies. Um, and there's a couple parts uh, that I think you should be aware of or know. So if you're ever having a conversation with an adjuster, you'll kind of know what to say and you'll understand where he's coming from and what the reality of that situation is. So in the who runs the show and who we're dealing with, obviously the Department of Homeland Security is the highest level. They're on top of FEMA. Uh, they oversee the National Flood Insurance Program, which is pretty much run by the Write Your Owns or the NFIP directs, and they engage independent adjusting companies, engineering firms, or subs to, to deal with claims they in turn engage independent adjusters or staff adjusters. That's the guy who actually goes out and sees your claim. When you make a phone call to the adjusters or when you talk to adjusters that are reviewing Sandy claims now, they're adjusters. They're most likely, every single one of them was in Sandy, was deployed in Sandy. They're CAD adjusters. Um, so in the whole Department of Homeland Security down to a guy who's shows up to a house when there's a storm, somebody's kind of overseeing the process or running the show. And it's the right your own insurance companies. And they're subs. So it's really the CAD adjuster who goes out is being told what to do by the independent, in the, uh, give you a quick example, um, colonial claims. An adjuster will go out from colonial claims 
colonial claims tells them, here's what you write, here's what you're allowed to put in an estimate. And depending on the right you're own, there's different criteria or different restrictions. And I'll go over some of those as we get through. So the other point that I want you guys to know is there is a big difference between an adjuster and an estimator. An adjuster, in its true sense of I'm an adjuster, is somebody who investigates a claim, they gather information, they analyze and apply coverage to the situation, they document a claim file, and ultimately they'll negotiate a settlement. There are thousands of adjusters who never wrote an estimate in their lives because they're adjusters. Estimators inspect properties, they record damages with photographs or measurements, they use a, a platform for estimating, and they generate an estimate, and when they're asked, they defend their estimate, or they'll, they'll justify why they have certain line items. The, I was asked by someone from FEMA what the difference is and if they're interchangeable. It was an attorney who asked me, and I said, it's the, almost the, the analogy is you can be an attorney and not be a judge. You can be a judge usually. So there, with adjusters and estimators, they're interchangeable, but they are two totally different things. And guys on the phone, I have a question up here. Uh, what if an adjuster that, let's just say in Sandy, the adjusters didn't write estimates. The NFIP didn't pay them X dollars to write estimates. They went out, they inspected a loss, they took their own measurements, they took their own photographs, and they informed the insured of what the coverages were and what their responsibilities were. Because the SFIP, Standard Flood Insurance Policy, says that the burden of presenting a claim is on the insured. So if you went up to an insured and said, I'm your adjuster, you're going to have to find a builder. They all found builders and people to rebuild, or not all of them, most of them, to, to give them pricing to do things. And if that adjuster went out and told them what they had to do to present their claim, and the homeowners got estimates and gave them to the adjuster, he could review the claim or the estimate against his notes, against his photographs. He could have said, I need to talk to your builder. Let's, you know, can you break this down? Can you explain this further? And he could have interacted with the insured and their builder to settle a claim. That's done every single day in the claims world. It wasn't done here. It's not usually done in CATs that way, but it's done every day in the claims world. So CAT adjusters, there's some important things to know about them. They are their own unique entity. CAT adjusters, in order to get a flood certification number, need to go through an NFIP certification class. It's a one-day class. Uh, I've been to two of them this year. They do not teach estimating. They don't teach you how to measure. They don't teach you how to use Xactimate or, or what to do, or what pricing is. It, they give you some information. It's valuable information. In my personal opinion, it is not enough to send somebody out into the real world to settle or adjust for a claim or write an estimate. A percentage of adjusters have never adjusted a claim prior to Sandy and never written an estimate for a storm, for flood damages, or ever in their lives. A large percentage of adjusters were assigned caseloads greater than they had ever had in previous storms. I know this because I know these guys. I've been dealing with the same actual adjusters since 1992. I get phone calls and cats, as I did in Sandy, hey buddy, it's Joe, where are you? I'm in, uh, I'm in Ortley Beach. Oh, I'm stuck in so-and-so, can you go look at two losses for me? I've gone out and inspected losses for NFIP adjusters. I've made the showing, I've taken the pictures, I've done that stuff, and reciprocally I've said, okay, I have one or two for you. Can you go by and take pictures and let me know what's going on with it? Because in the storm, there's times I would go to an appointment and it would take me four and a half hours to get onto the island. Then I'd have to park my car and walk a mile and a half through sand to actually see the loss. So next is most adjusters for Sandy were instructed to see all of their losses first, then start writing their estimates after they've seen those losses. 
I personally go out, I look at a loss, I spend X hours there, I go home and I start writing it. Or I go to a loss in the morning, I leave, I take my measurements, I leave, I go to a Starbucks or a somewhere, I sit down and I sketch the whole thing and exactimate, then I go back and do my scope. When you go out and you look at a claim or look at 40 claims, go back to wherever you come from, South Jersey, Mobile, Alabama, wherever it is, and you start writing estimates, you do not have the benefit of, I was there yesterday or the day before, and you rely on the photos you take. If you don't take the right amount of photos, I have an example estimate here that I actually cut down the amount of photos. I have, I think, 85 photos, which I don't think is enough for a claim. So I've reviewed hundreds of Sandy estimates from NFIP adjusters that have 15 or 20 photos. There's just no way to actually go back and know what was in that house or what the subfloor was if you didn't take a picture of it. Um, almost all adjusters were during Sandy, were during every claim they ever wrote, and are currently given restrictions and limitations for estimating that is inconsistent with FEMA's guidelines. One example, all state two coat limitation on paint or seal and paint. Pick up an all state claim, look at it, it'll say paint two coats or it'll say seal and paint one coat. I've had the conversation, I've had the conversation with all states claims guy, I've sat in judges chambers talking about differences in settlement conferences, and I've brought it up. I said, they're only writing two coats when there's three. And the answer was, with national counsel, local counsel, claims manager, sitting in front of the judge, was FEMA doesn't allow us to pay more than that. My response was, really, well, I asked Dan Thorne two weeks ago in Washington and I said, why do you only say that they, why do you only tell Allstate that they can only write two coats? The answer was, what's the problem? I said, the problem is it's not enough money. He said, just write one coat and triple the price. FEMA pays for damage caused by flood. And if the repair for damage caused by flood is to put a new piece of wood in that needs to be sealed and then paint it with two coats, or drywall that needs to be sealed and paint it with two coats, FEMA's totally fine with that. If you show me an all-state estimate that pays three coats for something, I'll donate $100 to any charity you choose up to five grand. Find it, I'll write the check the same day. I haven't seen it. Next, almost all adjusters, and this is a very important thing to understand and know, almost every adjuster, not just in Sandy, especially in Sandy, but not just in Sandy, are instructed not to change unit costs in Simsol or Xactimate. They're, they are not allowed to. I've been in depositions with adjusters who have said, I'm not allowed to. I've been all the way up where nobody actually knows who says you're not allowed to, but everybody knows you're not allowed to. There's a reason for it, which I'll get into. I'm going to recap real quick. One is I've done a lot of work. I, I may know what I'm talking about. Two, the write your owns and their subs basically run the show. They're the people you have to get to to get something done or get around to get something done. There are three, there is a big difference between an adjuster and an estimator. And you'll learn by, when you speak to an adjuster, he really knows the policy, he really knows those things. When you start bringing up some of the items I give you or some of the items that were in that report, you'll know the difference between an estimator and a non-estimator because the non-estimators will not know what they're talking about. They, they won't know what I'm talking about. They just don't know it. You find an, a true estimator, he knows you have to add a toilet flange to the toilet, especially in a, in a flood claim with salt water because it's metal. Um, the, the fourth, one, two, fifth thing is, uh, fourth, the adjusters who go out to the property may be certified, but they may not be qualified. That's a statement that is used many times in NFIP training in their, in their certification classes. Um, an NFIP adjuster was most likely estimating under specific guidelines. 
that are inconsistent with the standard flood insurance policy and FEMA guidelines, and adjusters are instructed to not change unit costs. I'm going to go through a very quick overview of unit costs, why they're bad, why they didn't change, why what you see in an estimate was just not enough to do the work. Two major estimating platforms used in Sandy were Simsol and Xactimate. Pricing for Sandy estimates were based on databases and price lists. I'm going to use Xactimate as an example. Xactimate uses real-time feedback from uploaded estimates to change price lists. So if we take this month's price list, it should have been factored for current conditions. As costs rise in a month, they're supposed to be adjusted in the unit costs, then the next month's price list will reflect those costs. So if Sandy happens in October, forget the date, it's October, and you use a October price list, it was not factored for Sandy because nobody knew Sandy was going to happen. So November should be factored, December should be factored. What should happen is there should be a big spike, and then as costs and the region starts leveling back out, the, the, it should have a trend going down. Estimators and, and adjusters are instructed by Exactware to upload their estimates. When they settle a claim, they upload their estimate. It gets uploaded into exact analysis, and that affects the next price guide. Any modified item in Sandy, so Mrs. Smith gets a new boiler and it's $16,000 and Xactimate has $4,000, what should happen is the adjuster should go into Xactimate and change the line item, and I'll go through that next. So when you look in an estimate and you're reviewing an estimate, you're going to see just general line items. Remove and replace quarter round, three quarter. It's going to have a remove price or replace price, tax overhead, profit. It's going to have an estimate. It's just going to be line items all the way down the line. This is an example of an Xactimate estimate. When I'm putting an estimate together in Xactimate, this is what I see. And for the guys on the phone, I have just the, the screenshot of the area where you enter the pricing and you choose um, category and the selector. So I choose HVC for a boiler, BLR with the, the greater than because it's 165,000 uh, BTU boiler. And in this area, I'm able to put overhead and profit, whether it's taxable or not, whether the contractor did it, the, home I, the homeowner did it. I'm able to look at the replace price and the remove price. Now, when I speak to Xactimate, they tell me, when you change a price, don't change it in replace because there's two components that make up replace, labor and materials. They want you to go in and change it more appropriately to what the actual increase is. So when I go in and I hit replace and I want to alter the replace price, I hit information and it opens up another screen. This tells, this tells me how much they have. So it has $2,186 for the material. It's got the labor of $1,924 and a total of $4,100, then all the other factors. Now, you can't see this too well, but everything that's gray, you cannot change on this screen. What's white is equipment and market conditions I can change. I can add market conditions in. When I change market conditions, it changes the price, but it doesn't change the overhead and profit, and it doesn't calculate tax properly. So what happens is, I'm, if I'm an adjuster, I'm supposed to change the price. If I can't really do it here, then what I do is, which, which basically write their owns and independent adjusting companies tell people to do, is they do what's called a bid item. You'll see in some estimates, it won't say HVC BLR for boiler. It'll say bid item. And you'll see in a lot of estimates for work that's already been done that it's a bid item. So what would happen here is I would do HVC bid 
and bid item would pop up. And then what I would do is I would put the replace price. I would then add a note, which shows up in the estimate, and I would put that this price comes from Bill's Mechanical and they already did the work. An appropriate estimate would, estimator would go in and then remove overhead and profit and tax because that invoice was done by an individual contractor, the cost is not subject to overhead and profit, and tax should be included in the invoice number. When this is done, and you use a bid item, instead of altering the price itself, what happens is you don't affect the price list. So I took a Sandy estimate at, that was written in, uh, I think, October or November, and I went back to September 2012, 22 months up to June 2014. What I did is I took the exact same estimate, and I copied it, changed the price list, copied it, changed the price list, and this is a chart of every price list for those 22 months. This is a graph of what happened in Sandy. This, these are price lists. This is Sandy happened right here. Almost all lines are pretty stagnant. There's two that have like a pretty big increase, but you have to look at the numbers here because this big increase here in a hundred and some thousand dollar estimate represents $659 worth of increase. And this other increase, the spike down here, is drywall. It represents $181 worth of drywall change. By not changing the unit price, in every estimate that the cost is higher, you're artificially repressing the next price list. This chart and this graph is just pure numbers of artificially repressed, repressed price that's used in Sandy. So, Estimating platforms contain thousands of building items to choose from. It's an a la carte. If you go to my house or you go to a restaurant at Thanksgiving, you say, I'm, I want the turkey. We all know what you're getting on your plate. It's going to be everything because it's Thanksgiving and you want the turkey. So it's all going to be there. If you use Xactimate or Simsol and you say, I want the turkey, you're going to get a plate with a piece of turkey on it. It's an a la carte estimate. If you don't put in the mashed potatoes or order them, you're not getting it. If you put in a boiler and you don't put in for a circulating pump, it's not included. If you don't put in for the valves, the pressure relief valve, or any of that, it's not going to be there, which is part of why the numbers are so low. The number itself is not factored for Sandy or post-Sandy, and the line items aren't included. So if you're talking to an estimator or a reviewer, and you see a line item that says boiler, you can say, what about the zone valves? There were four zones in this house. What about the piping that was submerged under salt water? What about the circulating pump, etc.? So going back to the boilers, when I look at the boiler and I go and I say what's included, it says gas boiler and install installation labor. There's a note, this is Xactimate, that says if check valve and or circulating pump is needed, use, and they tell you what to use, PLM, CHV, PLM, PUMP, which you would plug in here and it would give you those line items. So what you're going to see in an estimate you review is one line item that says R&R &R boiler, oil fired, or whatever it is, and it'll have a price list, and in most cases, the model number and serial number are written down, and the gentleman that mentioned earlier what happens in an Irene claim where they paid for the boiler and they know because they checked the model and serial number. Well, in that Irene claim, they may have paid for the boiler and they may not be entitled to it now, but they didn't pay for all the other things that are included. So this is, there was a boiler sitting right next to this. In this estimate from the carrier, the boiler was in there, remove and replace the boiler, but none of those valves, none of that piping, nothing else was in there. So what your, what your estimate should look like is you've got the boiler, You've got R&R &R, the furnace vent, which is the vent that sits on top of it. It has to be affected. In this case, six linear feet had to be changed. The circulating pump, the water pressure regulator, the brass ball valves, those things that shut off the water for each zone, submerged underwater, damaged, rusting, has to be replaced. If you see an invoice for a boiler, an invoice that's handwritten, 
that says replace boiler $12,000, they replaced all this stuff. That's why it was $12,000. It's not because somebody was gouging anybody. There was market conditions. I have clients that bought boilers for six or $7,000, went, bought it, stayed there, while their wife drove around looking for somebody with a pickup truck, while they were in the parking lot with a boiler, looking for somebody with a pickup truck to pay to drive the boiler to their house, then later they found somebody to put it in. It's gotta be included for it to be paid for. So recap, uh, he who uploads the most estimates controls Xactimate pricing. As of yesterday, this is from Xactware, 45 million estimates were processed with a total value of a lot of money, trillions of dollars. Every one of those estimates that is uploaded without changing a price and putting a bid item in will artificially repress pricing for moving on for however long. Uh, estimating platforms are a la carte. You get what you ask for. Um, there's more to a boiler than a boiler. The estimating platform will give you the information if you look for it in the line item. Each one of you, if you're going to go down this path of identifying whether it's included or not, just need a resource that can look for you. If you have pro bono guys, we do it all the time. You email somebody at us at Canopy, we'll print you the page for that line item. And it says right on there, includes this, excludes this. And we'll give you what it should look like in the line items that should be included. When you look in that um, 14 items document that I did, there's sheets in there that are for each item, what's included and what's not. And in the boiler section, it'll have the sheets for all of those components that are from Xactimate and what they include. Next item, wet versus gut. I'm familiar with it. The, the build it back price, I think, is $169 or $160 some dollars per square foot in Long in the city of Long Beach. The actual repair replacement costs are over $300. The build it back number is not a accurate reflection of what it actually costs to build. Not only is it not accurate now, it was not an accurate reflection of what it costs to build prior to Sandy. Even with that, so I understand yes. in, the, in the Dewberry. I'm saying same like kind and quality, including the multiplier, is not inaccurate. I'm saying it's low. It's still too low. Yep. Now keep in mind a big item is same like kind and quality. And I'll I'll when I bring up one photo, I'll address it. This one house was reinspected by an engineer, an adjuster, FEMA's National Council, and local council. One of maybe the adjusters, there were five people that went out and reinspected a house. That those five people determined there was possibly a fifteen thousand dollar overpayment, and at the end of the day, it turned out there was an over over a hundred thousand dollars underpayment. In reality, it's how you look at it, and I'll, I'll just briefly touch that for a second. When everybody went out to reinspect this house, it was in Breezy Point. It was a pretty little beach house that you would love to have. It was all yellow walls with white trim and nice uh, uh, ceramic floor. It was just a pretty beach house. It had the shutters, the, the, the mini blinds were white wood. It was a nice house. They determined because they went back, they replaced the upper cabinets, and they went back with a granite countertop that they had been overpaid. So the doors in this house, pre-Sandy, were stained grade mahogany. The doors post Sandy were a white colonist pressed cardboard door. The trim pre Sandy was stained oak. Post Sandy was paint.
painted MDF, medium density fiberboard, which when gets wet swells and is a fraction of the price. Their ceramic tile floor, which was kind of considered an upgrade, cost half the price of the hardwood floor they had. That same house, they didn't, they replaced the subflooring, but not the subflooring under the walls. And their stairs were rotting out, and they didn't replace this, the subflooring under the stairs. The siding is falling off their house because the sheathing is rotting away, and what the siding was nailed to, the nails, was going into sheathing that wasn't rotting before, is rotting now, so the siding's coming off the house. That's a house I'll use, I have as an example. If you've seen the gas line photo of rusted gas lines, it's from this house. And when I got done crawling out of their crawl space, I said to a 78-year-old woman and her daughter and their grandkids that were playing, I said, in my gut, I feel like shutting your gas off, putting a padlock on it, going to the building department and having them condemn your house. You have a life safety issue. Your gas lines will eventually leak. They will eventually leak into the crawl space, fill the crawl space, start filling your walls, hit a pilot light, and blow up. It's just a fact. A gas pipe shouldn't rust, shouldn't be rusting. You need to replace it. If you find an estimate from Sandy that they replaced all the gas piping and all the accessories for the gas piping, I will donate $100 to any charity that you choose up to five grand. So that's 10 grand total that can come out of my pocket. Um, so wet versus dry. Look in any estimate, pick a room, you will see, remove half inch drywall, hung tape, floated, ready for paint. Then you'll see replace half inch drywall, or you'll see one line item that says remove and replace wall, drywall taped and floated, 100% slash four feet. There's multiple things wrong with this. One is when I go in, and you'll look in the report, when I go in for the line item and exactimate to replace drywall or remove drywall, that price is assuming you are gutting an entire room and you are gutting an entire house, or at least half of the house. It is assuming that you're just going in and ripping the drywall off of everything in that room. It's assuming that there's no trim, that there's no light fixtures, that none of that stuff exists. It just assumes you're going in and ripping it off. It also assumes that it's dry, not wet. And just like there's thousands of items in Xactimate, there's actually line items to tear out wet, drywall up to four feet, and there's category one water, category two water, category three water. So when you do a flood cut, you'll see in the report, it's not just go in and rip out drywall, it's go in, determine the height of, not the flood line, the height of damaged drywall by using a meter and getting to where it's dry, and then it's dropping a chalk line, getting a level, and using a straight edge and cutting a razor line that all takes time. It takes more time to cut that line and separate that little separation it does to rip out all the drywall in a room. So Xactimate calculates for that. It's not per square foot, it's actually per linear foot, and they're $9 a linear foot to take four feet of drywall out, as opposed to 55 cents to take out dry drywall when you're gutting a whole house. They even have a line item to replace drywall up to four feet tall, which is $9.47. And what that is, keep in mind, the drywall number, and there's one other factor that's, that's assumed in this price. This price in Xactimate assumes, and if you look at the, the description, it says it assumes that the contractor has the drywall as an in-stock or in-house item. I don't know a contractor that stocks pallets of drywall in his garage, his house, or his storage unit. At Reliance Restoration, we have our drywall company that delivers, Dubell Lumber, that delivers, delivers drywall to us. When I get drywall delivered to a house, I have two guys that show up at whatever time in the morning, 
They go upstairs if I have two-story house and they take out a window so I can deliver drywall to the second floor. Or they wait for a truck to come. The guy comes with a boom. He brings the drywall in the door. And these guys load it in. On smaller jobs, I send two guys with a truck to Home Depot or Lowe's or Duvel. They pick up drywall and they come in. Exactimate says in their description, this is assuming it's an in-stock item. You would need to consider how the drywall is getting there and put in for those items. When I talk to Exactware pricing guys, they tell me, well, just use labor and calculate the distance or fuel for the truck or labor for your time that's there for them to load it in. Exactimate is telling you what to use. So this price, which is triple what's in your estimates that everybody got paid on Sandy, is still a low number. And on top of that, it's a factored number, a, a repressed number. Um, Xactimate also says to you, when you do a flood cut, that your new drywall is really smooth and the drywall that you didn't replace may have three or four layers of wallpaper, may have been painted 40 times over 70 years. So they tell you to use DRYTXT to do a smooth skin coat over the new drywall or over the whole wall to get a consistent finish. FEMA pays for this. They do pay for it. I know they pay for it. I've gotten paid for it. I've gotten paid in a two-foot flood line to replace all the drywall. Because the reality is, is a flood cut where you only put drywall, and I have a video on the web that does a drywall report. When you take a flat surface and put spackle on it or joint compound tape and two more layers of joint compound, you're going to have a hump in the wall. That's not what you had pretty much. Now, if I go into a house that has patches in the walls anyway, they're entitled to patches. But FEMA says they will put you back to pre-loss condition for covered items. So there are line items that are much higher. So I just touched on wet versus dry, also drywall. Um, this is some of the items that Xactimate has for drywall, I mean for wet items. So they have remove underlayment, and then they have tear out non-salvageable underlayment in category three. It's double the price. Remove carpet pad for 14 cents or tear out wet carpet pad, cut bag, category three water, 67 cents. Carpet, double. Um, paneling, double. Um, flooring, engineered wood flooring, floating floor, $1.41 to remove. If it's wet with category uh, three water, $2.16. Now, I spoke to Xactimate price guys. I said, um, we don't actually bag flooring. What we do is we rip it out. It's laying all over the floor. We kind of bundle it up. We take tape, uh, duct tape or gaffer's tape. We wrap it three times, and we take that little bundle, and we carry it out. Their answer, and what do I do for the pricing? Their answer to me is, if that's around the same price as putting it in a bag and carrying the bag out, then just leave the price. Or they tell you, change the price to what you think is more appropriate and upload it into Xactware so you can affect the, the price list. Trim, baseboard, trim, and all those things, they're in there. If you see any estimate, just look at it. It says remove or replace drywall. Just say, guys, you didn't factor for wet. Now, one thing to consider when you are reviewing a claim and you're dealing with a file examiner is ask your insured who did your demo? Because if it was the Mennonites, then they overpaid on that portion. Plain and simple. You're not entitled to it if, if somebody else did it. Or somebody could have done it if somebody did it for nothing. Uh, by the way, I can assure you, if you have a reviewer make a claim compliant to those 14 items, and there's, I think, 40 items. I've only done 14 so far. But... If you have them compliant and they take out all the demo, you're still going to wind up with more money. So wet first dry, some drywall stuff. Room measurements versus footprint measurements. I was at a loss in Sandy, and there was an adjuster who was, a real, who was currently a realtor in Texas who the market was slow, decided she was going to be a cat adjuster. I met her at the loss, her... Uh, uh, Person, her assistant that was with her held one end of the tape measure. She took the other end of the tape measure and she was looking at it and backed up to the wall and said 12 feet 8 inches. 
So I had a very weird dilemma of not commenting on anything about her body, but other than the fact that the, the tape measure wasn't to the wall. So what happens is adjusters go in, and for certain line items, they measure, they use a tape measure, they stick it on the ground, and they go from base trim to base trim, or they use a laser level, and they go from wall to wall. And what they're doing is they're excluding the measurement under the wall. So when you have subflooring, which I'll go into, and you're going to replace subflooring, and you measure from one side of the wall in that room and from this side to the other room, and you see in, a, in an estimate subflooring in the room, they, they consider zero for the subflooring that's under the wall, under the interior wall and the exterior wall. Here's what the issue is. Most people hired contracts, contractors to replace their subflooring, and they did. They replaced it right up to here, and they didn't replace what was under the wall. And what's happening is, is that sheathing that was submerged, the NFIP adjuster already determined that it was wet and damaged and needs to be replaced. It's not being replaced. It's not being considered under the walls. On top of that, structurally, sheathing is supposed to cover a depth from one end to the other. And when you have a break in a subfloor where there's the old subfloor and a new subfloor, that is not a structural sound, that is not as structurally sound as it was before. If people tell you now, when it's windy outside, my house shakes, it's likely because they changed the structural integrity of their home. Partially because their exterior sheathing is rotting three or four feet up, and that's not exactly holding the, the house plumb as it was before. And they replace sheathing, and their house is actually moving differently than it did before. So this is a from Xactimate, from an estimate. This is a sketch of a house, and it totals thir each every room in this house totals 1,304.55 square feet. When I do a footprint, it totals 1,438.18 square feet. That difference just in the square footage under the walls is 133 square foot difference, which is equivalent to an 11 by 12 room or bedroom. It's missing from the estimate just because the adjuster measured a item that goes the, the, the whole area of the house and he measured them inside of the wall. Yes? Is there something that we can look at on the adjuster's report to spot whether this yes, is the first Yes, absolutely. Um, you, if you look in any, and I, I have an example in here, if you look in any room of an estimate, just open the estimate, look at it, living room. If you see subflooring, it's only in the living room. Xactimate only calculates for the square footage in that room. If you look higher up in that room, it'll say floor square footage, and it'll tell you the amount. Look back at the, est at the estimate, and it'll say that amount. So not only that, but when you talk to Xactimate, which I've done, and said, well, what are you including in this price? They're saying, that's, imagine a deck. If they're building a brand new house, they put the framing in, they put the, the subfloor in, and they don't put walls up yet. The price in Xactimate for remove and replace a subfloor, A, is assuming dry. It's also assuming you're doing all of it. And it's assuming that there's no walls on top of it, and there's nothing, there's no staircase on top of it. So they have line items to remove wet subflooring. And when you calculate, when I say to Xactimate, do you have a line item for under the walls? Because that's what's going to rot, and that's what's going to cause cracks in this house five years from now or eight years from now when they go to sell the house. Their home inspector is going to say, oh, well, they actually never replaced the subflooring under the walls. That's why your house is settling down. And it's not even covered because that's long-term settlement. It's a whole bunch of other issues, but almost every or any person that had Sandy damage that was underpaid through this program this way is going to have that issue. FEMA does not pay to go back into a house, take off all their new flooring, take off all their drywall, take everything off and replace the subfloor. The most you can get is enough to have done it back then. They're still damaged. Here's another catch, and the gentleman at the end brought up the Irene piece. Well, what if they pay you for the subfloor under the walls now and you have another storm? 
there's no way for you to actually do that work now. There is a way for you to do it, but it's going to cost you more money, and you don't have it. So what should happen is somebody should agree with FEMA that for every claim that's reviewed and a payment that is made post-settlement, that those people are not prejudiced for those adjustments or the work they've done. Because I've gone, the woman that I told you about the house in Breezy Point, she took the money that she got and she spent that much on the house. She didn't replace her sub floor, she didn't replace her gas lines, she didn't replace her front door, her back door, any of her windows or sheathing or her siding. She didn't do it because she didn't have enough money. She can go back now and replace the siding. She can go back now and replace her gas piping and, and the electric that wasn't replaced, the sheath, sheathing, the front doors, but there's certain things that they can't, which is a subflooring under under the walls, and they shouldn't be prejudiced now because of an action of somebody else. This is a photo, and it's one of the ones in the report of a gas line. This is a bracket holding up a gas line. When this breaks, and I've got photographs of sandy, damaged homes where the brackets have already broken, when it breaks, there's nothing supporting your gas line. It's added stress onto the joints of a rusting gas line. It's a problem. It's also rusting out and rotting out the wood, the subfloor, the, the framing that it's attached to. This gas line and bracket is from the house in Breezy Point that I told you about. This is an example of uh, what happens when you have a gas line. Just a blown up house and neighboring houses blown up. Same thing with electric, rough electric. Now, two things. Gas lines, if you're getting gas lines, rough plumbing, rough electric, they belong in the footprint measurement. They run under the whole house. You, th there's no reason to be penalized one room because the adjuster's got it in his estimate in the room itself. So your insulation that is in a crawl space should be for the footprint, not for the individual room. The rough electric, rough plumbing, rough gas lines, any of those items, subfloor should all be footprint measurements, not individual room measurements. This is a, a this is in, one, in a photo in the report of rough electric. This is actually, I'll, I'll reference BX wiring later, but this is metal wiring that is rusting away. There was a substantial fire in, on the Jersey Shore, and it was attributed to electric post-Sandy. I've been in buildings, I've been in houses, there have been many commercial buildings where the NFIP paid for the gas meters, they paid for what the insured replaced, but there's conduit that runs underground that comes into these mechanical rooms, and they're usually three inches or four inch conduits. And the water was above that, and they filled those conduit lines. I've stuck cameras down in those lines, and there's still water in there. So there, is, there are electric lines rusting away as we speak. There are electric lines that are still submerged in water from Sandy as we speak. They were just ignored. And by the way, they were ignored by most contractors, by most public adjusters, by most builders, and, and most other people except for the people that their builder said you need to do it, and they just did it. So I'm going to address subflooring. Um, this is a typical framing scenario where you have your footing, your foundation. This is one of the, the uh, photos in the reports. You have your framing, your subflooring. You can see that the exterior walls and interior walls sit on top of that. And when you measure from room to room, you're missing that, you're missing this. And it's just... There's stuff that sits on top of it. You can't use the same. You can't say, okay, I'll take the subflooring out of the room and put it in the footprint because it takes our guys, two mechanics, two laborers, and Glenn McAllister or somebody stopping by the job checking up on it to replace the subflooring under walls. So if it's a Breezy Point bung or a Long Beach bungalow or a bigger house, when you have to replace subflooring under walls for a level of a medium, small to medium sized house, it takes a week to do. We go in, we take on both sides of, of a wall, we put ledger boards, we cut out some of the subfloor, we jack it up from below, we 
cut the bottom plate out with sawzaws. Now we have about an inch and a half room. We take out the subfloor, we slide a new subfloor in, we put a new plate down, we lower it, and we screw those back. We glue and screw that framing back in. Whether it's a five foot wall or an eight foot wall, we still have to do individual walls. So house sizes don't matter as much as the fact that you have to do it. So when I go into a bedroom, whether it's a 10 by 12 or 14 by 16, I can only do a certain section at a time and I can only do one wall or so at a time. It's around eight to 10 grand to replace a subfloor underneath walls and the main subfloor. I write it in Xactimate and you'll see it. I have an example estimate and I'll, I'll post it if it's not already posted. I have a scope for it. It's the materials that we use, and this is work that we do. It's not a guess, it's, it's what it costs. It's the labor, and I'm using Xactimate unfactored pricing. It's the labor for the carpenters and the, and, the, and, the, um, uh, and the laborers to do the work plus the materials. So this is a subflooring situation post water loss, and you can see here, this is the staircase. Not only is the subfloor under the staircase and under the wall framing, the, the original hardwood floor is still under the staircase. So they took the subfloor out, the remediation guys, up to the staircase. And nobody took it out under the floor. So I have to take the staircase apart. In this case, we have to replace the staircase. But I have to replace the subfloor under these walls and under the stairs. This is an example of a sandy house I was at a month ago. They already had a contractor that came in, replaced all the subflooring in the house. Um, what I did was I unscrewed this piece of subflooring. And you can see over here, the subflooring doesn't go all the way over. And in this area right here, that's a close-up. This is the brand new subflooring that's not attached. To, it's, it's, screwed to the, it's screwed to these beams, but it's not attached to the outside walls. So the rotting planking is still under those walls. And in this area here, when they took it out because it was tongue and groove, it just came out. There's no subfloor under part of this exterior wall. And only because the woman didn't have enough money, she didn't fix her house. It's sitting exactly this way from Sandy. So this is an example where the contractor actually did what the NFIP estimate said. They replaced the subfloor in the room. It's not a fix, it's not a finish, it's not what the people want to tell you. Um, when you mentioned before, how do we look for these items? This is an example of an Xactimate estimate and a Simpsaw estimate. Um, r and &R sheathing, tongue and groove, it is in the room. If you see it in any room, it, it doesn't include what's under the walls. Um, r and &R oak flooring, you already know that they didn't put in to remove wet flooring. Um, my R and R drywall, tongue tape floated ready for paint. It's assuming you're doing the whole room. You're not. It's assuming it's dry. It wasn't. Uh, it's this is for a flood cut. It's it's wrong on every sense in every sense of the way. Um, another item which I'm going to touch on, which shows up a lot: air movers, dehumidifiers. Air mover there, dehumidifiers, air movers. You see here, remover in place, subflooring. It's in the room. So your square footage of the floor, where am I, uh, ceiling and floor, 61.30, remove subflooring, 61.3. It, it's right there. Once you know where to look, it's going to be in the same place every time. So real quick recap, gas lines, gas lines, gas lines, gas lines, gas lines, gas lines. You have to. It's, it's, we haven't seen the explosions from Sandy yet. They will happen. Talk to a firefighter who is local in a town, say, are you guys getting reports for gas leaks? The answer is going to be yes. Or if it's really good plumbing lines and gas lines, it'll be yes six months from now or a year from now. Yes? Is, is the, would the estimate need to say something like gas lines? Or is oh, it going to be called something wait, else? you're not going to find it. It's just, no. it's just, find this, I'm going up to 15 grand exposure. I will donate $100 to any charity if you find an estimate written by an NFIP adjuster that says replace gas lines. I, I haven't seen one. 
I give to charity, I'll happily give to your charity. Um, almost all adjusters wrote to remove and replace or remove dry building components. Almost all adjusters measured from wall to wall or trim to trim. And they excluded what's under the walls. Items for footprint measurements should include gas lines, subflooring, rough electric, plumbing, insulation, and a crawl space. If you see insulation in a crawl space and you see a picture and it's like this much room, Xactimate has a line item for confined spaces. It's a fraction of what it actually costs. I'm not a really big guy. There's some crawl spaces I couldn't get into. The one that I took the board off, there was an access to the crawl space. I couldn't fit it. I had to take a piece of subfloor off to be able to get in the crawl space. An adjuster who sees, and here's, and I'll, I'll give you an example for gas lines. Go in the kitchen, the mechanical room, or the laundry room, and look for the oven, the dryer, um, the heater, or the water heater. If the, the freestanding range is a freestanding gas range, there's gas lines in the house that need to be replaced. If you see the boiler and it's a gas boiler, there's actually that little yellow flex line that has to be replaced that's not in the estimate. Xactimate has a line item for it. And they have a line item for the shutoff valve that's not included in the boiler line item. It's not included in the, in the stove. So if you have a gas stove, if you have a, a, an electric stove, there's a 220 line that's most likely not in the estimate. If you have a gas stove, the pipe that comes out of it as part of the rough plumbing is not replaced. The little escutcheon that sits on the, the plate that makes sure bugs don't come in is not in it. The shutoff valve is not in it, and the flex line is not in it. So it's just money they owe. Any adjuster you speak to in Washington or where they are, the two places they are, they know, if they're an adjuster, they may not. They may think it's included. If they're an estimator, I assure you, they know it is not included. For the guys who write them, because I talk to these guys every day, Mark, you putting in gas lines? Nope, I'm only allowed to put the item in. Okay. And I'll tell you a very quick difference between CAD adjusters who listen and don't listen, because I hired a bunch of CAD adjusters to write estimates for us in Sandy. So we're sitting at a restaurant, we're all doing the you know, war stories of claims, and one guy says to me, I write everything in my estimate and I submit it, and if they call me and tell me to take something out, I say to them, give it to me in writing and I'll take it out. If you don't give it to me in writing, I'm not taking it out. He's a CAD adjuster who worked Sandy before I hired him. And another guy who I hired who was a CAD adjuster, working Sandy, said, yeah, but when did you go home for Sandy? He goes, well, after the first wave. He got his 30 claims and went home. The other guy, Chris, said, I stayed for seven months. I don't put anything that doesn't belong in that estimate. When he says doesn't belong, he doesn't mean is it supposed to be there because it's, it, it, he doesn't mean it's supposed to be there, but he means the right your owns don't allow him to put it in or CNC or or um, Simsol Adjuster Sur Insurance Services or Colonial Claims doesn't allow them to put it in. So if you do the bidding, you stay and you keep doing work. I said to a guy, Chip Merlin, who's a, a lawyer, um, a plaintiff's lawyer, I said, Chip, when you depose that guy, ask him for his first 10 estimates. You look at his first 10 estimates, then look at every estimate after that. The draft, the first draft of his first 10 estimates. You will see a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't exist in any estimate after they straighten them out. It's do it or go home. That's what the adjusters know. Yes? So the, the, the reason for that happening is, is a little mysterious to me, to some of us, because what, what motivation does the right your own carrier have? I'll give you the complete motivation and the 100% answer. Okay. We are talking about Sandy right now. Just hold Sandy totally out of this. A right your own is an insurance company. I'm all state. Forget flood. State Farm doesn't even do flood anymore. This is the business practice that they employ to maximize profits. Absent morals and ethics, it's a great business practice. It really is. Go get gas. Don't pay. Drive away. You have more money. 
this is the way they operate their business. Every single day, every single claim, trillions of dollars worth of surplus. Now, I step over here and I wear a hat that says fiduciary of Federal Reserve. Uh, if I actually do it different than I do it over here, then I'm saying that I'm doing something wrong over here. So wouldn't that be a dilemma? Yeah, it's a really big dilemma. But when they're over here with their fiduciary hat on, their sovereign immunity, it's even a bigger umbrella for them. So they get to do this bad practice every single day in regular life and instruct their people what to pay and what not to pay. And then over here, they can do business as normal with no problem and no chance of a problem. Except now, Eastern District Court of New York, there's a little bit of a problem because there's some RICO stuff. The gentleman that brought up the, or somebody on the phone brought up the, the United Technical Reports and Suspect Engineer Reports. I can tell you as we speak, there's attorneys that just because it's a high-rise report are getting full policy limits and 25%. So your answer to your dilemma is just go see one of the three judges and they'll give an order that FEMA gives you every single draft report on every single case that you that opens up your case. It's, it's happening. I, I know it's happening because I'm writing estimates for those lawyers to include all the damages that are supposed to be done. So that is the reason that it's being done. It's the way of business outside of NFIP and that program. Go back to my first example of an adjuster who would just, so there's a fee schedule for adjusters. They actually get a percentage at a certain height. And I've heard it from everybody. I've heard it in probably 80 or 90 mediations, countless settlement, settlement um, conferences with judges. Your Honor, our adjuster has no reason to lowball an estimate they have an incentive to write higher. And I hear it over and over and over again, I tell the exact same story. I'm sitting at dinner with two adjusters, and one of them said, I said, well, what's the deal? Why, why aren't you writing all this stuff? Don't you get more money? He says, Jeff, if one fee level is at 30,000, and the next one's at 50,000, and I have an estimate for 31,000, what do you think I'm doing? And I said, I know exactly what you're doing. You're going to bump it up to 51.5 or 52 so you can get the next level and leave it there. Because that way you're not going too high and you're not doing this. He goes, you're 100% wrong. The time it's going to take me to go from 30 to 50, I can write four estimates cut and paste for 30 grand. And I'll make more money by quantity than quality. This is not me saying it. This is the guy who does it. They have a, a saying for it. It's called gun in and running. So when you start reviewing estimates, you'll notice, let's say you get this, I have the benefit of being involved in over a thousand claims, and I could pull an adjuster and pull five estimates from that adjuster. It's the exact same estimate. The rooms are the exact same rooms. So I go on reinspects and I start in the master bedroom, there's three windows, five outlets, a ceiling fan, and whatever. I go into the son's bedroom, there's only one window, and there's a ceiling fan, but there's only three outlets and one switch, but there's three windows in that estimate. So it's just a cut and paste. So that cut and paste in, in SimSol, their macros, in Xactimate, it's cut and paste. I have public adjuster estimates. They do the same thing. My guys can cut and paste. They can only cut and paste line items. So if I know I have the same sub four throughout, and I use a... Ver I use a um, I use a profile that's that it's what the insurance carriers use. So I can actually see. I can print out a report on every one of my estimates, and so can the insurance company, of every single item that's overridden. It turns green in the estimated thing. There's an audit report that can tell me every change that was made, just by one click of the button, by having that ESX file. It tells me how much time they spent. It tells me that they, on this day and this time, they opened it up. They did X items and it changed the estimate this much. So when I see that a guy opened an estimate for 11 minutes and 80 items were entered in, you can't do it in 11 minutes. So he's a cut and paste guy. I get rid of those guys. I can't use them because they're not doing what their job is. But that's how it's done 
in the business. That's the gun in and running, guys. That's why you have crappy estimates. And they throw in subfloor because, hey, it's, it's damaged. I'm throwing it in. It'll take them more time if they entered the other items. Eventually, and the reason I did that 14 items, and I'm going to do a full list of all the deficient items, I have an agenda. My agenda is to see an equipment connection in an estimate at some cat five years from now. It's to see actually somebody in a footprint put the subfloor, put the labor to do the stuff under the walls, or to put the shutoff valve for the toilet. That's, that's bad in the estimate. That's my agenda. That's what I want to do. Cat adjusters should realize all their estimates will go up a certain percentage, and they'll automatically make a cut and paste and be at that next fee schedule. But the right your owns, who's running the show, are instructing them not to. It's a fact. So exterior sheathing I'm going to go into. This is the same picture. There's your sheathing. This they're replacing. They're replacing this wood, and it ends right here. This is the exterior sheathing that actually goes down lower than the floor sheathing. This is what it looks like. Here's a flood line. Water wicks up depending on the type of sheathing and what it is. There's insulation in the wall that wicks it up higher. But the sheathing goes below this. So when you write an estimate or you look in a room where they're replacing footprint or room that they're replacing sheet, the, the subflooring in the room, they're not paying for the sheathing on the outside. They're pressure washing exterior uh, sheathing. Some of them are replacing it. They're removing and reinstalling siding. Doesn't happen. Nobody's doing it. But they're ignoring the exterior sheathing. Now what happens is when I go gut a house, I have a crawl space underneath. I've got fans in here. I have access to both sides of this sheathing through fans and dehumidifiers. When I'm in a wall on exterior sheathing, I have access to one side of it. The other side has siding or brick and tar paper and vapor barriers. I don't have the ability to draw water or dry that sheathing. That's why it's rotting as we speak. This is a uh, Simpsaw, forget that it's Simpsaw, well, either way. Simpsaw estimate, remove and replace wall insulation up to two feet. He's doing the perimeter of the house. That's for the insulation from the inside. He's replacing it from the inside. Totally fine with that. He's pressure washing exterior side. This is a sandy claim. Here's a picture of the front of the house. The water line was right up to here. And there's a reason we know the water line was up to there because we pulled the siding off. And this is the tar paper below it. So here's what you have. You have the wood siding that's rotting. You have a foil insulation. You have a rigid insulation. And you have tar paper. It's rotting away. There's mold growing in, it's trapped in between vapor barriers because this foil and this is a vapor barrier and it was filled with salt water. Not only just salt water, but oil and whatever stuff was floating around from whatever's, whoever's yard. It's there and it's organic. The stuff that's organic breaks down, but the stuff that's not organic is still there. So this is this house, pressure wash exterior siding. If they paid for the subfloor in the house, they owe for the siding on top. They do, they do, they do, they do. The only way to get to this is to rip all this stuff off. I have to take off all the other stuff. So if I'm removing the siding, I gotta take off the, I gotta disconnect the deck to pull it away because siding goes behind it. I have to take the railings off. I have to take the numbers of the house off. I have to take the light fixture off, the hose reel, I have to take off just to be able to do this work. When you see an estimate where they're replacing the door, that door is nailed onto the exterior sheathing. If they're replacing the door or the sheathing, then you have to take the door off. When you replace sheathing to a level higher than the windows, and they have replaced the window on the inside of the room, they have the sheathing on the outside of the room, but in order to remove or replace the window, you have to take the siding off around it. Because the window has a nailing flange and it has to be flashed around it. It's all simple things that are completely left out of estimates. This is the house that I told you in Breezy Point that has the, rotting, the rusting gas lines. This is a view, if you can imagine, laying on the ground looking up at 
this is the bottom of the vinyl siding, this is the vinyl siding. There's insulation with a foil cover on it. There's plywood. There's another layer of house wrap. There's the old siding from 1950-something wood siding and the wood planking. This is all rotting away. I have a video where I'm going up to this woman's house. The siding is tight, it's tight, it's tight, it's tight, it's loose, it's loose. It may as well be a curtain hanging. And that's the floodline. It matches the floodline because it's rotting away. It's, I can stick, I stuck a meter in that. It's actually still wet. She replaced her subflooring, but not under the walls. They biocided, they sprayed everything, they insulated, they put a vapor barrier up. They put a vapor barrier. When I crawled into her crawl space, I'm looking at plastic. What that vapor barrier did, because her house is air conditioned and the crawl space isn't, the vapor barrier created condensation in between the vapor barrier. It got its moisture from the rotting sheathing. So all that new insulation, is moldy. All her framing is moldy. Everything in there is moldy because she didn't, and I don't know that I can blame her for not replacing her side. She didn't have the money. She's 70 some years old. She took what FEMA gave, what the NFIP adjuster gave her. I don't want to say FEMA because I really don't think it's FEMA. Although there's been enough complaints that somebody should have said, you know what, maybe we should go different. So who's running FEMA? We went through. So basically, this house, five people, national council, engineer, local council, and an adjuster, and somebody else, I don't know who it was. Uh, and national council was the Nielsen firm. They were at this house. They reinspected this house and determined she had no duty. So I'm going to jump through more items. Toilet components. You will see in an estimate, just like you see subflooring or painting or anything like that, just go into a bathroom. They're either going to have removed and replaced the toilet, or they're going to have removed and reset the toilet. So in Xactimate, it says when you remove and reset a toilet, they are assuming that you're putting it in an adjacent room. So I'm the plumber. I come in. I take the water out. I disconnect the toilet. I unfold it. I take it, and I stick it in the hallway, or I lay down a tarp or a piece of plastic, and I stick it in Jimmy's room. Okay, great. Well, in Sandy, there's no room. There's no subfloor that's going to be there. There's no place to put the toilet. I put in my estimates a storage container. And I put in to clean that toilet because you don't really see cleaning of the toilet. So what should happen in a remove and reset? Now, in some of the cases you're going to have when a remediation company came in or the Mennonites came in, they gutted the house. They tossed the toilet. It's gone. Does FEMA owe for that? Maybe not. But the reality is, at a minimum, they owe to remove it to clean it, to wrap it up in something that can protect it, to store it somewhere, to bring it back, and to reinstall it. They also owe, depending on the height of the water, for a toilet seat. And the top tank is bolted with metal bolts to the bottom tank. If the water was high enough, they owe for the new bolts. And the toilet flange. This is a house that was built later, doesn't have copper drain pipes. It has PVC drain pipes. This is the toilet flange. It's metal. It's rusting away and rotting. There's a line item in Xactimate for a toilet flange. This is, next to the toilet, the escutcheon, the supply line, and the angle stop valve. There's a, you all, we all know, there's a hose that goes from here to the toilet. They're not in the estimates. They belong in the estimates. So when you see, this is two examples of, of, uh, of estimates, remove and replace toilet, remove and replace an angle stop, remove and replace plumbing fixture, and a toilet flange. In this estimate, the rough plumbing is in the footprint. Or you can put in rough in a fixture. Um, in this estimate, toilet detach and reset, clean, clean the toilet seat, toilet flange, stop valve. What's missing out of this estimate is where the toilet's going and wrapping it up. There's All you do is you put in cleaning labor and you put in half an hour to clean it, wrap it, put it somewhere else, and bring it back. It's It may be $35 or whatever it is, but it's what makes up the difference in why your clients don't have enough money or didn't make the repairs. Uh, I, I left this in just because this is one of the notes that put electric per square foot is addressed in the exterior section of this estimate. 
this is, this, by the way, neither of these are NFIP estimates. Um, this is a guy who wrote an estimate, and in the exterior portion, he has all of the footprint items in the exterior, because that's where he's got the exterior measurements. Um, so toilet, boiler, we know all the things that are missing out of the boiler. In that report, I have all the items, and I have them listed, and I have Xactimate's description of them. We can do the same thing for SIMP, so I just use the Xactimate as an example. Sales tax. This is a super simple one. If it's a Simsol estimate, and you'll notice at the bottom in the corner it says Simsol 6.0 or whatever it says, on the total page, there is general contractor overhead, general contract profit, uh, plus excluded items. I'll get to that in a second. But in between estimate totals with overhead and profit and estimate totals is applicable sales tax in the rate and excludes or includes whatever it includes. If you see an estimate written in Simsol, the top is what you're likely to see. Look in between these two items, there and there. If you don't see that, that means sales tax is not included. You may even see a note that says sales tax is included in the line items. It is not. So I was in settlement conferences with a, a very higher up in a, in, an, in a write your own and we had the conversation, just like I said, let's call FEMA. I said, let's just call Simsol. And the guy said to me, I'm friends with him. I know him. I said, okay, well, I have a cell phone number if you don't. But let's call him up and ask him if it's included. No, I don't need to do that. And next day, he muttered that he's learned a lot about Simsol. It's not included. There is a class action that's been filed specifically on Simsol and the tax issue. So when you settle a claim, if you're not getting taxed, it may be wise of you to settle that claim and not release them from that issue. But I can tell you right now, and, and this is, I don't want to veer you from gas lines, gas lines, gas lines, gas lines, but if you have an estimate that's, let's say it's a $205,000 estimate, and it's a client that is going to, that's app, that's has applied or is, an a, is able to get the ICC $30,000, and it's on Simsol, the one item you need them to change to max the 250 is the tax. And that simply, you're at the 250. You don't even have to look anywhere else in the estimate for issues or differences. Gas lines first, tax, easier to play. Um, items excluded from overhead and profit. So same page we saw before, uh, missing the tax, but less excluded overhead profit trades. I gave you the example of the boiler earlier where I said if Joe's Plumbing came in and did the boiler and they did it, it costs what it costs. It's not subject to overhead and profit. Every Simsol estimate you see will be less excluded tra OP trades and be a high number, a relatively high number for the estimate. Um, this, in the Simsol report, is the items that are excluded. General conditions, finishes, carpet, pad, kitchen equipment, HVAC boilers, cleaning. There's a list of things that make up, in this example, $21,000. There's a reason for that. So this is a screenshot of my computer when I'm working with Simsol. I use a profile like carriers use. I went into Simsol's flood program. And when I entered a brand new file, I started the estimate, and I chose flood, and I started to just before I even started any line items, anything, this popped up, an audit message. And it seems like it's a big deal, and it seems like it's important. And it says, forget the at, at. At the time of this Simsol version release, the National Flood Insurance Program recommends the repair costs for the following construction trades be excluded from general contractor overhead and profit. That's not true. Okay? What the NFIP says is what every insurance company says which is proper that if it's not an item that's going to be addressed by a general contractor, it should be excluded from general contractor overhead and profit. It's very reasonable. The cleaning that was done wasn't done by your general contractor, that you're going to get to do the work. It was done by a cleaning company, and there's a bill, and that's you exclude that from overhead and profit. What happens is it gives you general conditions, finishes, carpet, pad, kitchen. This list looks familiar because it's this stuff right here. It's exactly what is excluded. Then it says it is the adjuster's ultimate responsibility to check, 
with their supervisor or insurance carrier to verify, deny, or confirm all current NFIP adjustment guidelines. This advisory is provided as a courtesy for warning purposes only. However, how many options do you see here? Remove trades or nothing. So there's an audit. I'm being audited, by the way. FEMA, the right your owns, the only thing they're afraid of is an audit. So mention audit to a flood person, and they're going to check, okay, I'm going to remove it, remove it. What an adjuster should do, an estimator should not know any different. What an adjuster should do is say, I have to match the item to whether or not a general contract, whether it is applicable to overhead and profit. And I go into exactly, and I check that little box off, and that's done. I'm a responsible guy. I've never talked to one CAD adjuster who wrote with SimSol that doesn't know that if you click the X to just close it, then it just goes away. They sit there and say, no, no, you have to do it because it's in the flood thing. And NFIP and FEMA says you have to. FEMA doesn't say you have to. The NFIP doesn't say you have to. But in this program, you have one option to say yes. That's why you have all that missing. So recap, exterior sheathing got wet too. Could not be dried as easily as subflooring that was replaced. Siding has to come off to replace the exterior sheathing. If it's a brick wall, it's going to cost a lot of money to take the brick wall down, but the only way to get to the sheathing is to take the brick wall down. It's an appropriate line item. FEMA has NFIP, write your owns, FEMA, CAD adjusters have all paid to take down brick walls to get the exterior sheathing. I know that for a fact because I've collected it. Um, most NFIP estimates for toilet repairs or replacements are deficient. They're missing the shutoff valve, they're missing the supply line, they're missing the escutcheon, it's just missing, they're missing the flange, they're missing <coughs> uh, adjusters writing estimates using SimSaw, likely excluded tax. If you find a SimSaw estimate with tax that was written for Sandy, that includes tax in it, send it to me, I'll donate $100 to the charity. Uh, adjusters writing estimates with SimSol possibly excluded overhead and profit for items where over pro overhead and profit was warranted. It's possible that all of those items, because they were underpaid, that they did go get their own carpet guy. It's possible that they did, but that's not the true measure of their loss. The true measure of their loss is what it would have cost at the time of the loss. And that should include general contractor and overhead for all the items that would have normally been done by a general contractor and not emergency work, remediation work, or where there were anything that was done temporarily before the adjuster was out. Everything post-adjuster should be, I should pay you properly, I should pay you the right line items, they should include overhead and profit, so like a human being, you can go hire a contractor and have enough money to put your house back to the way it was. Not put your house back to living in it, but put it back to the way it was. Because there's a woman with grandkids sleeping in a house that's going to have to be estimated. Okay. Um, other part of the recap is you can raise money for your favorite charity. Uh, remediation and cleanup. Dehumidifiers, fans, air movers, they're all in there. If you open up, and in the book, in the, in the, book, uh, the report, it has the actual line items for dehumidifiers. It says, this is Xactimate. They wrote this. It's on their program. Includes equipment costs for dehumidifier unit based on 24 hours of runtime on the job site, excludes setup, takedown, and monitoring. They tell you use WTREQ for setup, equipment, takedown, monitoring if needed. They even have a line item. Now, the reason why this is separate is I do it per job. So I know there's 10 rooms, there's going to be this much equipment. It's the same guys. It's not going to take them much longer if they're taking five pieces of equipment off or eight pieces of equipment, but they have to go there. And because nobody knows the amount of days that they're going to be on site, you separately calculate set up and take down. The other thing is at the end of every job, this piece of equipment that's in this nasty house gets cleaned. Xactimate has WTR uh, decon to decontaminate just to wipe it off. It's done by every contractor. So when I say to a CAD adjuster and the review guys, hey, um, you don't have to set up and take, oh, FEMA doesn't pay for that. Yeah, they do. FEMA paid for Surf Pro to go dry a house. You don't think their price included set up and take down and monitoring and, and a generator and all that stuff? It did include it. FEMA pays for it. It's just not in those estimates. So it, it doesn't just 
show up. Even if the homeowner does it, they're entitled to federal minimum wage and their expense to go to the rental place to get the equipment and bring it back and set it up and, and, and return it. Steel brackets, hangers, plates, and accessories. This is a post-Sandy house. Uh, this is structural members. There's probably 280 to 300 of these brackets that hold their house together because they're not nailed. They're used for brackets. The brackets are all rust, are rusting away, and the wood's rotting because when wood touches salt, when metal touches salt water, it creates some electronic something and does something and, and does that to it. It's not good. It's bad. The IICRC says after a flood event, you're supposed to pressure wash all the stuff. Nobody did it. Nobody knew to do it. Adjusters did it right. My clients that I knew pre-Sandy that called me up, I said, get a guy out there and just pressure wash everything. Well, it's going to be it's gonna be wet. It's already wet. Just wash it. Gut it, pressure wash it. Don't dry it. Gut it, pressure wash it, then dry it. And then you'll prevent this type of stuff. The IICRC S500 says to do it, yet nobody does it. Nobody puts in for it. It's not there. It has to be replaced. Um, BX versus Romex. Um, if you go into a house, you see the electric, you see either white or yellow or orange wiring that's vinyl, plastic coating on it, or you see metal that's like a spiral metal. metal. This is Romex, this is BX. For 250 feet of Romex, is $43 at Home Depot, it's $104 for BX at Home Depot. This is actually not the BX I'd put in my house because what I buy from a supplier is a much heavier metal. It's a higher quality than what's at Home Depot, but you can see it's over double the price. A plastic box is 76 cents. A metal box is $3.10. Xactimate's price for an outlet and switch is for Romex and a plastic box. If you're looking at, this is where you find this. Just look through pictures. Somebody mentioned earlier we don't have the carrier's file. The homeowner probably didn't take pictures of their crawl space or their electric. I do. I take pictures of it everywhere. If you see this metal, it's a little fuzzier here, but you'll see it. That's BX. That house needs BX wiring, not so. If you see it, you'll see in an estimate, it'll say outlet in plus wiring. That's not for rough wiring. That's outlet and wiring to get to the next outlet. Or that's outlet and wiring to get to the home run, but it's not for all the electric that's run under there. Keep in mind in the crawl space or the basement where the electric meter comes in and the, and the panel is, that's all the electric for the second floor too. That's the electric for the house. It's not just the, the electric running to that outlet. You need footprint, replace square foot electric, Romex, or if you see a photo of BX, it's got to be BX. Romex should be $6, BX should be $11 to $13 a square foot. Um, recap, no one in Sandy had drying equipment magically appear and disappear. It didn't happen. I'm sure it didn't happen. Um, metal rusts, it does. Um, BX electric costs a lot more than Romex, and then once you learn where to look, you'll almost always find the same items in the same places. Once you start looking at estimates, you'll see those items. So now it's Q&A. Well, that was a lot to take in. It's a lot. So let me just say this. Aside from me talking fast, which I appreciate because when I was down in Katrina, I couldn't talk slow enough. But I'm in New York, so I can talk fast when people understand me. It's when you guys were talking earlier, you're talking about the ACC, the LABC, the BBCC, whatever. I don't have no idea what you're talking about. I don't expect anybody to know this stuff or understand this stuff. But for the people who are going to be involved with it, I'll make sure that the resources are available for you to, like for sheathing. I have a video on sheathing. For foundation damage, I have a video on it. It's on YouTube. It lasts six minutes. You watch it. It's done. It's just me flipping through some stuff and talking. So the important thing is for you to know that the guy on the other side or girl on the other side of the phone in Washington is wrong. They're wrong because they're they have a document, what they decided was the wrong thing. Allstate actually said, we are writing estimates, we are just doing a quick estimate, 
to get money into people's hands and then we will finalize the claim. We just need to get people and money in their hands. I dealt with over 400 Allstate estimates that they just gave the first estimate. Their file was closed when we contacted them. Not only was it closed, but that estimate was uploaded into ExactMet and affected the next month's prices. It's bad stuff, but these are the places to look. The simple thing for you to do is say, hey, adjuster, I'm going to email a link to you, or I'm going to, I'm going to mail this report to you. By the way, FEMA has that report. FEMA had that report well before it was released to anybody. I know that I released that report to FEMA, and FEMA appreciated it. They liked it a lot. They were interested in more items and being able to come back to discuss certain items, and we opened that door to them. And I spoke to adjusters who are currently writing claims in Texas, and not one item, one item there has made a change to anybody in Texas or anybody writing currently. And I spoke to people who are very close with people that are reviewing claims who don't know one item on that list, except they have people that are calling up saying, I need your estimate. Before we even talk, I need you to send me a revised estimate that's compliant with the 14 items. And the guy says, what, 14 times? I'll send you a link to it. So it needs to be compliant. It needs to be done. One other thing to what you guys were talking about 